Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, praising you for the opportunity to feast upon your word. May we more and more recognize that our citizenship is in heaven, that we are but strangers and foreigners here. We'd ask that the Holy Spirit take charge of this hour and minister the marvelous word of God to our hearts. Please strip away that which is poorly spoken, that which has not been reasoned nor thought out, but just teach us truth that we together might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We are studying together uh, 2 Corinthians verse by verse. Uh, in our last study together, uh, we were in chapter 6 and we ended at about the 7th verse. In the fourth chapter, we were told that the ministry to which we have been called is a ministry which does not require deceit, doesn't require bait, that we are to simply proclaim the truth of God's Word and we're to proclaim that to audiences which have two types of hearts in them. Those whose hearts have been blinded and cannot hear in those hearts in whom God has commanded light to shine. Since we are able to rest upon the sovereign power of our God, that He is indeed sovereign, it isn't necessary to modify the message in any way. There will be those who do not hear because they cannot hear, and there will be those who hear because God commanded light to shine. Now, in the fifth chapter, in the fifth chapter, we were led by the Holy Spirit to the realization that the heart of our message is the reconciliation that God has accomplished in Jesus Christ. We were told that the truth of the matter is God was doing something. He was reconciling the entire world system unto himself and he was not imputing men's trespasses unto them. And the purpose of his revelation is to commit to us that ministry, the ministry of this reconciliation that was completed when Jesus Christ said, it is finished. We then began the sixth chapter and we saw that the Holy Spirit, we saw the Holy Spirit imploring us that we don't take this message that has been the subject of our concern for several chapters, a message of the grace of God. We do not take it in an empty or a vain fashion. You know, even in the Old Testament scriptures, God declared that He had heard the Lord Jesus Christ in an appointed time at an accepted time, which again highlights the purpose and the program of God. And then there then, after this, we, it, we saw it, it follows a group of 20, uh, it's followed by a group of 27 exhortations, I should say 28, 27 preceded by one, patience, uh, the steadfast endurance of the, of the child of God and the confidence that God knows what He's doing, that He's on the throne, that He has a purpose, that He has a plan, that He has a program, and that we are part of that plan and program. Uh, in the following list of 27, I then suggested that the first nine, uh, this, they were, these were three sets of nine. The first nine were a... Uh, a personal introspective consideration in my fellowship and communion with God. You know, the affliction and the difficulty that, that follows that walk, and I talked a little about that. Uh, 
And I, th I think I suggested, I, I have on several occasions, if, if we think of the wanderings of the children of Israel in the wilderness who had to wander for 40 years in an insect-infested wasteland, needing a pillar of cloud by day to give them shade and a pillar of fire by night to, to keep them warm, and existing totally upon the supply of heavenly manna that they despised, that they became tired of. You know, they preferred the junk of the world system, you know, to the heavenly food that God gave. I don't think that picture is very far from us. But they were being led by God to a promised land of rest, not heaven, but the spiritual rest from actually believing God. And I spoke about the example of God's redeemed people, uh, Israel, in the wilderness who didn't enter into the land of promise and rest because of their unbelief. That included Moses. So that we, the, the church, basically wouldn't do the same, but rather rest in His promises as we journey through this wilderness of our own, this life, what we call life. We looked at uh, that walk of difficulty, of affliction, and in our last study together, uh, we looked at the nine that dealt with our uh, upward consideration, our, our fellowship with God based uh, in the Word of God and directed by the Holy Spirit directed by the power of God and the Holy Spirit. We have nothing separate from the Word of God. This, it, this is all we have. It is the source of truth, the only source of truth. There is no truth but this book. And if we are to be proper proclaimers of the ministry of reconciliation, you know, it has to be centered in the Word of truth controlled by the Holy Spirit because we were not commissioned to, to declare what we assume the message is, nor are we told to put it in words which might be attractive to the audience. You know, increase the size of the group or the financial income or whatever it might be, but we are rather in, enjoined to proclaim truth by pureness. Pureness. I don't believe in that second group that the primary emphasis is pureness in your moral life, but pureness, pureness in the Word of God by knowledge, by knowledge, not that you understand Einstein's theory of relativity or that you're the world's expert in archaeology or anthropology or any other discipline, but knowledge of the Word of God by long suffering, and this by a relationship with other Christians in the Word of God. That is an extremely difficult experience. It can be. We are all at different levels of spiritual growth, and we know that God causes the growth. You know, all of us would like to be monks, you know, where we could, you know, just sit in our safe place and in our little castle dungeon, I don't know, room somewhere, and just meditate on the Word of God and not have to put up with the oddities of other people and other Christians. You know, unbelievable the conclusions that Christians can reach. And if we are to be faithful and pure in that ministry, that is in the truth of the Word of God, it must be in an attitude of understanding You know, an endurance, an endurance with others who are also God's children by the Holy Spirit, by love unfeigned, that is genuine love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and the left. And I suggested, I believe I did to you, that that is not your personal righteousness. That's the armor of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, I cannot... I cannot imagine that I'm redeemed, and yet I know I am, and I know in the midst of all the carnality of my flesh, 
I am clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that conviction and that assurance, we can proclaim the Word. If we don't have that assurance, then our entire ministry will be directed toward a human drive for human uh, righteousness, a human performance. And you'll become more and more work-centered and less and less grace-centered. You'll, you'll be more and more concerned about personal discipline, personal holiness, and personal righteousness than you will be about the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the imputed righteousness of God that has been written to your account. I am not by that inferring that there should be no concern in your life for personal discipline, you know, personal righteousness or, or personal holiness. I am su suggesting that if that is your supreme concentration, folks, you cannot minister the gospel of Christ. And now in the eighth verse, I see a section that deals with my outward conflict, the, the discipline of my ministry and your ministry, which deals with those people to whom you're ministering to uh, in uh, one degree or another. By glory, that is honor, by, by honor and dishonor. Honor and dishonor. I can't reach the conclusion that that, that that is my glory. I recognize the Lord Jesus Christ prayed, Father, glorify them, glorify me, and then glorify them. I, I, rec I, I recognize that the Scriptures declare that when He shall appear in glory, then I, I shall also appear in glory with Him. But it seems to me that as I begin this consideration of the outward aspects of the ministry of reconciliation, the glory is that of Christ. But it says, by glory and dishonor. Now, we were told in, uh, in 1 Corinthians that the true messenger of grace is a despised messenger from man's standpoint. You know, when the President of the United States decides to send somebody to speak to somebody, you know, the man, that person, whoever it is, carries with him all the glory, all the honor of the office, and we ascribe him that. But when the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, the sovereign monarch of the ages, when he sends forth his messenger, he sends him as sheep among wolves into a hostile environment to one where he's not ascribed the glory which he represents. The next one says, by evil report and good report. Evil report and good report. I am persuaded, and I will, I'll simply throw this out for your consideration. Isaiah ministered alone. Jeremiah ministered alone. Uh, Elijah ministered alone. Daniel ministered alone. And all of these men ministered in a hostile environment. Jeremiah's ministry was in Jerusalem, and God had sent him you know, to the true remnant. And yet his ministry was in a hostile environment where he was surrounded by a multitude of those who said, we are prophets of Jehovah. Uh, we speak the word of truth. We have the same scriptures, uh, the same temple, the same altar, same sacrifices, same language. And yet God called them prophets of Baal. Jeremiah was a, a lonely minister of truth. The Holy Spirit seems to have developed a theme in 1 Corinthians and, and on into the, the first part of 2 Corinthians that, that what the Corinthian believers had done, you know, had, had gone about 
the way Israel had, had, they basically went the way Israel went in the wilderness, where that they were involved in all kinds of religious activity, but very, very little truth, and that the true minister appeared to be the one despised in their eyes, as was Jeremiah and Isaiah and, and Daniel and Elijah. I think if, if one, if folks, I think if we are properly proclaiming truth, then, you know, you know, we would, should expect good report. And yet I have a Bible full of illustrations that were men proclaimed truth, yet in, in, in many cases it was accompanied with evil reports. So there, there's, it seems to me like there's going to be both. If I am uh, greatly concerned about the evil report and I have a deep appetite for the good report, then I, I may be tempted to modify the message a bit, you know, uh, you know that I accentuate the good report. You know, I must, I must deal with the good report and the evil report based on the pureness, the knowledge, the, the word of truth, the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and it goes on. As deceivers, yet true. You know, a good translation of that, I think, would be as true, yet taken as imposters. It's a difficult experience for any Christian, any Christian, to proclaim truth and be taken as an imposter. Uh, if you honestly proclaim only the truth of God's Word, don't expect to be enthusiastically received or accepted in most areas of Christian service today. As unknown yet well known. Unknown yet well known. I'd suggest to you that the, the known is known of God because there is purity, uh, doctrinal purity, uh, pureness of that fellowship with Him and the truth of His Word. There's a, a confidence in the heart that I belong to Him and that this is what He has declared and yet it's not popular among the masses, not, not by any stretch of the imagination. You know, we expect the known man to have all the answers. You know, one who has enough kind of letters, you know, after his name, letters or digits after his name or, or something, and, and enough reputation or, or we can't get a crowd. I think that expression says that I'm known by God, but not popularly known by the body of Christ. As dying, uh, yet behold, we live. It's a beautiful phrase. I do not believe that that's referring to our physical death, though you know, you know, we've been dying ever since we were born. You know, you started to die the, the day that you were born. I don't think that's what the verse means. I believe if we are to be faithful in proclaiming the ministry of reconciliation, we must die. Death to self. You know, the growing realization that we have died to sin, self, law, the world, Satan, and even death itself, that the flesh profits nothing. You know, we will never die because we live. You know, for me to live is Christ. You know, the very first command that was ever given to us by God in the New Testament to Christians by the Holy Spirit in the epistles is to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. And there is an aspect of dying daily that others might live. Life, death works in us, but life in you. Does that sound familiar? As chastened and not killed. I believe that's absolutely imperative. It is crucial that God discipline us in the ministry of reconciliation, I mean, why not? I, folks, he disciplines every son whom he's received, according to Hebrews. There is no more important thing that God has done 
than to accomplish your redemption through the death of his son. We can talk about all the major problems in the world system, the world religious system, or we can talk about all of the activities of God, but it seems abundantly clear, at least to me, in the scriptures, that God's primary purpose and primary program was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It does not seem unusual at all then that, that God's, or shouldn't, that, that God's great concentration is in the proclamation of that message and that there is a continual chastening, child training, you know, instruction in the life of the believer and yet not killed or destroyed. I believe there is a, a continual chastening on the part of God among those who are His, yet he, he does not destroy us. And it goes on. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. We have, folks, we have the grandest message that anyone could possibly carry. It, it would seem to me that there is there is no possibility, but that that any here that people would just be ecstatic with the content of the message, and yet exactly the opposite is true even today. There's much more interest in human involvement, uh, emotional excitement, and and human production than there is the finished work of Jesus Christ. So it seems the most apparent meaning of that expression is that there is great sorrow because the message is not enthusiastically received and yet there's rejoicing because we know it's true. But I hear it said by the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ that he who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And, you know, I've thought a lot about that joy. What was that joy? Despising the shame. Surely one aspect of the joy that was set before the Lord Jesus Christ was doing the will of God. It's my prayer that in my life at least one aspect of my joy would, be in, would in fact be doing the will of God. However, it seems also apparent that another aspect of the joy set before the Lord Jesus Christ was you and me. He sowed us. He planted us. He, we are His. But when I look at my life, at its yieldness, at its production, you know, at its communion and fellowship with the God who provided eternal and infinite redemption, it seems staggering that He should love me at all. So it could be speaking of the recognition in the ambassador himself that though he rejoices in the, in the joy of a finished transaction, he recognizes that there are terrible, terrible limitations in his own experience you know, which are also true in the lives of those who hear. God has called us to a ministry which is not easy, and I am certain that the day will come when we understand fully and completely the reasons behind what God has done. But I am confident that they are valid reasons and that they are necessary for our growth both yours and mine, for your maturity, for my maturity. As poor, yet making many rich. As poor, yet making many rich. I don't believe the emphasis there is on money. I don't think that's in view at all. I believe what is in view is is the pureness of the message that I can do nothing for you except carry the message of a God who has done everything. Dearly beloved, there is not in the minister of the gospel of reconciliation any ability whatsoever to make you believe, to, to, to reconcile you to God. 
There is not within that individual any ability whatsoever to help, only to proclaim. You know, one of the diff one of the greatest difficulties I face is that I can't solve your problems. You know, you have no peace, no joy. You're, you're worried about sin all the time, and 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 what I, I what I want to do is help. I I don't want you to go through to navigate through all that, have to go through all that difficulty. I want every problem in your mind worked out as far as 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 I understand things. You know, uh, I can't do that. I learned many years ago that I have absolutely no ability, none whatsoever in the ministry of the gospel of reconciliation to do anything for you spiritually. Oh, I might be a good listener, a good sounding board, may even give you some good practical advice that anybody could give you and, and that, you, you know, that you probably knew without me saying it. But it is God who makes you rich. It is not the one who carries the message but the message he carries. And I believe the poorness speaks of the inability the man who carries the message is not great, he is not renowned. I have the truth of God's word that not many noble, not many mighty, not many high are called. Therefore every faithful minister of the word of God is 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 neither high, noble, mighty, or rich. You know, I, well, I'd be careful there on rich, I guess, because, you know, many doesn't mean all. There are wealthy Christians, there are rich Christians, but all of those who we seem to admire so much from the human standpoint, the Bible seems to say there are not many like that. There are not many of those that He calls. What we carry as a despised and rejected element of the world's system is a message of Christ's riches, what God has done in Christ Jesus, and His sheep will hear. As having nothing and yet possessing all things, and I believe that's in the same vein, uh, you know, the individual has nothing, there's nothing I can do for you, I possess nothing, you possess nothing, the only thing that you can do to another person is minister the truth of this book. The truth of, of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will work in their life because you're ministering truth. Now, I'm not arguing against any psychological or emotional involvement with other friends, not in the least. I believe this passage is concentrating on the conduct of proclaiming what God has done in Christ Jesus in reconciling His people to Himself. And I do that as, as having nothing yet possessing all things. And again, I believe the idiom speaks of the truth of the Word of God. The all things that you and I possess, the all things that God has given to you, folks, I believe is this book. Look, I love you all. I truly do. It's my constant prayer that, that you know, your eyes are open to the truth, to know what, what is the, the riches that you have in Christ, the hope of your calling. I pray for you all constantly. Please pray for me and for the direction of this ministry. Until next time, thanks for watching.